But welcome everybody. Um, so we have a little bit of information to share with you. And we'll begin by first off, just introducing the fact that certainly we feel uh, SAPL is a distinctly different design school and design school experience. Um, I think one of the things alluding to the research that, that uh, Josh will speak to shortly is this idea of our activities also inform pedagogy, they inform curriculum, and there is a nice mixing of the research that faculty members undertake with the uh, information and content that's delivered within courses, um, and especially uh, that kind of mix that is really seeking to, to engage both our community within the school, but also the school's connections to the community, communities outside. And that includes the broader university landscape. It includes um, our connection with the city of Calgary, and it includes also connections with industry and community groups within the city of Calgary to help advance and, and advance our research and to undertake uh, many of the exercises that, that our researchers pursue. Now, it looks like there's four things in the chat um, okay, and that's just Alexa sharing some information about our, um, about the faculty and research. So you can, you can go to, uh, uh, the web links that she provided to, to augment the information we're talking about today. Um, the SAP, SAP pardon me, SAPO uh, is a graduate school predominantly. Um, we do offer some undergraduate courses, but from the graduate end, we currently have somewhere in the neighborhood of 330 to about 350 full-time students. Um, and we've got 26 faculty listed. However, we've also been um, active in hiring new people to bring on board. And so look for an expanded faculty, faculty roster in the new year. Um, bold. I think it's supposed to say bold thinking for the for the built environment. Um, <laughs> missing a word there. Um, I don't know how that happened. My apologies. Um, but I think one of the things that's a really important thing to keep in mind is that design is a fundamentally optimistic activity aimed at shaping the way that we put our world together, shaping the way that we build our environments, that we inhabit our environments and the behaviors and activities that we undertake. And so we don't look at design as being just limited to say making a building or a particular landscape, but understanding that there are intrinsic connections that are made. And so there's opportunities for social, pardon me, for social innovation, future thinking, community engaged learning, disruptive design, an entrepreneurial mindset, and things that connect with a broader community um, and a broader sort of sphere of impact that we're, we're seeking to achieve. Um, the, at the University of Calgary and SAPL, we have actually two campuses. So we have our, uh, the main campus, the main SAPL facility located on the main University of Calgary campus. But we've also been able to establish a satellite location downtown, literally right next to City Hall. Um, this is in the old public library. And it is where we've established our city building uh, design laboratory. And it's, a, I think, a really wonderful facility. We use it for a variety of different things, including the delivery of courses, um, several meetings and connections with, with the broader community, as well as um, significantly a number of events. Um, and that's part of how we both share and connect with, with our communities. Now, that connecting with um, communities also sparks a little bit of an entrepreneurial mindset. And many people think of entrepreneurial thinking as, as something to get a new business started. And we like to try to take a slightly broader view of that understanding, that there is in fact an entrepreneurial way of approaching design exercises and research projects so that they have impact. And this kind of impact beyond the university is something both that the University of Calgary is hoping to pursue and enhance, but also something that SAPL is very, very much invested in. And so that idea of entrepreneurial thinking is really about understanding look, we've got this great idea. We want to be able to do something that perhaps speaks to circular economies or reaches 
uses, um, if you will, underutilized urban spaces and makes them accessible for, for, for kids or for families and that sort of thing. And recognizing that to make those things happen requires a certain level of entrepreneurial thinking, requires an understanding of who are the stakeholders and how do we get resources in place and how do we organize the, the logistics for these things to unfold. And so that idea of not just doing research that is, you know, that becomes a thesis and then gets locked away in the library, but is actually something that perhaps leads to impacts that can can inform or couch or or offer a setting, if you will, for people's daily lives. Um, the University of Calgary and the School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape is deeply committed to equity, diversity and inclusion. Um, our students have actually taken some entrepreneurial initiative in developing the Advocates for Equitable Design Education. That's the AEDE down below. And they are seeking to champion voices that may sometimes be overlooked in the creation of the built environment. And I think it's really important to also understand that within the built environment, various agendas are at play um, and various communities are impacted and involved. And it's important that we are inclusive of all of those voices, that we're not just speaking to um, a couple of voices or a couple of perhaps more typical uh, agendas that could be at play in developing the built environment and understanding that you know, the public realm is indeed for a broad public. We've delivered a number of courses and we have a variety of different sorts of connections to aspects of theory, aspects of um, deep expertise within our faculty members, but also to a variety of technologies that are in place from, from um, 3D printing to robotics and robotics fabrication um, to uh, just a variety of even larger scale 3D printers that start taking a look at, at how we can uh, begin to construct things more at a scale of the built environment rather than at the scale of something on the desktop. I think it's really important to understand that this connection to community and the number of events that we host and, and, and support is quite expansive. Um, we're really, really keen on making sure that we can connect with people in city government, with industry, and with community groups. And our location at the CBDL lab downtown, right next to City Hall, as I said, has really been uh, a crucial feature of SAPL that allows us to do that. So we've been able to support a number of public uh, lectures, social interactions, um, design camps, uh, a number of different other types of events and unveilings and gallery shows and a public exhibit exhibitions, things that all kind of showcase how we can connect and things that also allow us to facilitate those connections. Um, I think another thing that we've had a very deep tradition with, and, and again, kudos to our Associate Dean Research and, and Innovation, Josh Tarrant, and other faculty members like Jason Johnson, um, for putting together the Design Matters Lecture Series. We've been able to really bring some, some thought leaders within the design realm from all over the world to kind of share their insights and knowledge with us and their experiences from their practice. And I think one of the benefits with COVID is that we've actually been able to get more people joining us via Zoom for studio reviews and presentations um, and faculty events as well. So um, it's something that we have done in the past and it is certainly something that we strive to continue and to foster and to grow. We do maintain study abroad programs. Now these are predominantly within our course-based professional programs in the Master of uh, Architecture, Master of Planning, and Master of Landscape Architecture. But nonetheless, for people who are interested in the Master of Environmental Design, there's also opportunities and encouragement to publish your work, to get it into uh, related conferences, and to ensure that you can actually get travel funds to help support presentations at international venues. And I think that's also something we'll speak to a, a little bit um, in a few moments, but it's something that's really important that again, we, we don't see ourselves as being isolated, but it's so important that we disseminate our knowledge and that we make connections within the city, but also much further afield. 
student support. Now, these numbers are pre-COVID. Um, you can understand that we've been a little busy and it's been a little hard to kind of keep these things up to date. But nonetheless, we do um, have various avenues to support our thesis students. And that includes a number of student hires to act as teaching assistants and, and research assistants. There's also a number of named awards and awarded scholarships that we're able to provide to ME-DES students Excuse me, and we, we, you want to watch for those within our newsletter. We have a, a monthly newsletter that gets published, it gets sent out via emails. And one of the things we try to highlight within that are the deadlines for when those, uh, at, when the application windows are for those scholarships. Um, and then we also have funding support via our, via our website. So um, one of the things to check out are just what are those different avenues for support. Um, I think, bear with me here for one second. One of the things that we really feel strongly about too is that our students are involved in creating the work that we share. Um, a significant percentage of the work that goes up within our gallery shows and exhibits is student work. And we're constantly trying to foster things like competitions. Um, I think um, kudos to one of our faculty members, um, Alberto de Salva, Tierra, <laughs> and if I've got his name correct there. Um, he has been taking the lead on a really exciting new initiative in terms of uh, design competitions known as the CBDX. And just this, the most recent one had a number of entrants from around the world addressing aspects of borders and that kind of abstract condition that exists that we've fabricated between countries and places. So a really interesting uh, way of, of trying to invite work and to foster and enhance student work. I think another significant tenant of SAPL is that students make things. Um, we have an extensive workshop um, and a variety of digital fabrication um, capabilities. And so there is always this idea that again, students engage with materials, they engage with technologies, they engage with the research to try to understand not just necessarily behaviors of material, but rather what those relationships are relative to design and the impacts they can have within our environments. We have a number of different programs. Um, and at our core, we have three professional programs. These are graduate programs in the Master of uh, Architecture, the Master of Planning, and the Master of Landscape Architecture. In addition to that, we do have a small undergraduate cohort um, within the minor of architectural studies, and we are in the process of expanding our, our undergraduate offerings. Um, I think one of the things that's really interesting about that minor is that it allows students within their undergrad to complete coursework that is comparable to the foundation years of our master's program. And so people in the Master of Architecture, they take a foundation year, and then there's the M1 year and the M2 year. People who've completed the minor as part of their undergraduate can skip the foundation year and enter directly into the M1 year. Um, it looks like there's a, a point or a question in the chat. Oh, just uh, another post from Jen, thank you. Um, in addition to our professional programs, though, we also, again, have an arena for research with our students, and we have thesis-based programs. So the Master of Environmental Design, which you folks are interested in, is that kind of laddered thesis uh, program that sits as, as kind of a, um, an in-between step between the professional programs and perhaps later uh, more involved research in the PhD program. We also have a PhD program and we have a number of students that are currently enrolled within that. And it is actually, I think, a, a, a rich area of uh, work that our, our students are undertaking within that. And they have eyes to becoming future academics or experts in particular areas within their field. Additionally, we've just started um, a new doctoral program called the Doctor of Design. And this is a program that's intended to target mid-career to sometimes late-career professionals who are interested in addressing an issue from within their practice. And so it is an intense executive level doctoral degree that allows students to complete the degree within three years, and their research is practice-based within the kinds of inquiries that they're undertaking within their professional practice. It has been 
you know, very, very well received. We just launched it in the fall of 2020. And as of this year, we now have 20 students thereabouts. I think it's, I think it's 17, I should say, 17 students within the program between the two cohorts that have been admitted so far. And so um, it, and it is meeting with significant interest and perhaps something to put on your radar for down the road. Whoops. Um, and so that idea with the Master of Environmental Design that you can chart a course, that you can take the professional degree background that you may have either from our Master of Architecture or Landscape Architecture or Planning programs, or from a professional uh, degree from other, other locations around the world. And to kind of carve out a research interest with that, working closely with our faculty members and working to expedite that research within a, a particular time frame. The idea, of course, is, is to help people get a start on their careers. Oftentimes, people, you know, once they graduate with a pro professional degree, may start at a lower echelon within a pro uh, professional practice. And this idea of being able to develop a bit of research expertise and can sometimes catapult people into their careers. And I think Josh can speak to that perhaps a bit more fully when, when we get to his portion. Um, the structure of the degree, we have sort of two pathways. We have people who are coming out of our Master of Architecture Planning or Landscape Architecture programs, and they would start in the spring. So looking ahead to next year, they would start in the spring of 2022, and then they complete a 16th month program, allowing them to finish and defend their thesis by the fall of 2023. We also have something that's perhaps more akin to a more traditional pathway, which is starting in the fall of 2022 and then taking two years to complete the degree with a defense in the spring or summer of 2024. Perfect. Thank you, Alexa. So degree format, the MEDES, as we mentioned, takes typically 16 or 24 months. Um, all of our students actually even though they, we are the teaching faculty, are typically enrolled in the Faculty of Graduate Studies. And so they have regulations around how long it takes to complete a thesis degree. However, we've been really successful in, in holding people to the 16 month and 24 month timeframes that we offer. The degrees, uh, the Master of Environmental Design includes four course requirements. Three of these are required and they include the um, APLA, so Architecture, Planning, and Landscape Architecture, and Course 670 relates to research methods, 672 relates to writing for thesis and for research, and 674 is a course that we've just recently introduced that targets design innovation. And then there's also room for one elective course that people can take. Within the thesis, the research is project-based typically led by a faculty member, but that the student is carving out their own source of investigation relative to that. And there are three main phases to the thesis. Students conduct their research, they summarize and capture that research within a document where they're sort of saying, look, this is what I learned, this is what I found out, these are the findings, sometimes these are the next steps. And then this document then gets presented within an oral defense, um, which becomes the kind of capstone exercise for the thesis. Funding sources. As I mentioned before, we have graduate assistantships. Um, so there's graduate assistantships for teaching. There's graduate assistantships for non-teaching, which is somewhat helping out with the faculty, either supporting a course, but not necessarily participating in the teaching of that course. There's also research assistantships. And then there's a number of SAPL scholarships, university scholarships. And then within Canada, there is there are three levels of funding that come excuse me, from the federal government. And these are known uh, across the country as Tri-Council. And it includes the um, three areas, humanities, engineering, and, and health sciences. And so the, the three um, Tri-Councils are the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, the National Science and Engineering Research Council, and the Canadian Institutes for Health Research. And all of these agencies can fund faculty members as well as fund fund fund, <laughs> as well as fund thesis students and um, our PhD students. 
There's also opportunities for the Alberta Graduate Excellence Scholarship. And the MyTax program is another federal program that seeks to complement um, connections to industry. So if you're working on a research topic that may be applicable to a particular industrial client or company, um, we can arrange, um, or one can apply, I should say, for my tax funding that has you in a position working for that company, but then using that work as a some substantive part of your thesis. So there's a variety of different ways that we can do that. Again, looking at our, our pre-COVID funding total for, for the year prior to COVID, we're looking at $184,000. So it's not chump change. It's a significant amount that can go to um, our students to help them advance their work. And I think with that, um, I would like to inv uh, invite Professor Taran to perhaps share his wisdom and insights with regards to the, the nature of research within the School of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape. All right. Thanks very much, Barry. I, I think what I'll do is, um, I know that there's a, a couple of slides in this presentation, but I think I'll share a different presentation on here. Um, uh, so I'll just sort of drop this this other guy in here. Um, okay. And uh, we'll go from there. Okay, so I assume you guys can all see this, this presentation. Yep. Um, so there, this will be a, a little bit uneven. Uh, I think what, because I realized some of what uh, Barry has presented uh, today uh, actually um, overlaps a little bit uh, uh, in this. So I'll kind of move through those areas quicker and talk a little bit more about uh, kind of the, the, philo the philosophy and the approach to research that we take here in the faculty uh, and talk about how that sort of connects with, um, I, uh, let's say the philosophy of the university um, the way that we understand uh, uh, research projects really as, as serving stakeholders with ourselves being a key stakeholder and our students uh, being key stakeholders. Uh, and then talk a little bit about uh, some of the projects and, and some of the structure around that. Uh, so, you know, I am gonna spend a little bit more time on this first uh, point of really sort of defining the approach, um, maybe talking a little bit more about the CBD lab uh, describing a couple of the, the projects that we have, uh, the way that our research intersects with our curriculum, uh, and then uh, really talk uh, uh, in a little bit more detail about the MEDES degree, uh, but while mentioning uh, both the, the PhD and the DDES uh, at the same time. So to define our approach, this is actually uh, really quite important. Um, I, I think the without even going through these points, um, you know, the way that we approach uh, research here at the, at the school is really one of making real change happen, you know? Um, and so there are a couple of key questions that, that we ask uh, in order to make sure that we're, we're framing things the right way. So the first is that in, in many, many cases, we really do prioritize a design-based approach to research. Uh, and we find that this really complements uh, a lot of the other modes of research across the university and across the country. Uh, and we make a really unique contribution that way. And it also provides us uh, a really strong and clear way to connect with industry. So historically, industry might look to research to ask you know, more technical questions, uh, which of course we connect with, but also uh, in many ways, uh, the, the industry that we are um, uh, uh, plugging into uh, the, AE, the AEC industry in particular, although it's not exclusively there, uh, they are in general a design-based industry and, and, and oftentimes want to be able to ask certain kinds of questions, but aren't able to given their business models or, um, uh, or even just their, the expectations around what they're able to do or can afford to do. So uh, we really play a key role in, in helping unlock a future for them, so it's not this sort of um, purely, you know, pejoratively saying like a purely academic exercise, but really one that's highly integrated uh, with with transformation, not just of the built environment, but of the industry itself that's responsible for designing and producing it. And then, lastly, we we really uh, see ourselves as a connective entity uh, that we we not just we don't just connect out to industry or society, but but we, we connect very deliberately across the university to other researchers, other faculties for uh, in uh, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary contexts. 
and we also see ourselves as a really key and unique uh, player uh, within uh, the province and the region uh, to address challenges that are that are really facing facing those territories. Uh, so uh, we 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 understand that we have an important role to play, which is to say that our students play a really critical role in these uh, kinds of questions and challenges. But ultimately, the future is being designed here with us. I thought it would take you know just a moment to, to describe at least one definition of what design-based research actually is. Um, you know, it's it's both systematic but also flexible as a methodology aimed to improve both educational practices, but also um, uh, really sort of uh, wading into the world of collaboration uh, with not only researchers but practitioners in real-world settings. Um, which leads to more contextually sensitive design principles and theories and actually um, outcomes. Uh, so we don't just study stuff, we make stuff. And we make stuff when we do stuff. And I think it's quite consistent with how Barry has been talking about things uh, today. Um, the U of C strategic plan, uh, strategic research plan also really layers out um, a couple of, of of key points that we orient ourselves around. So matching strengths with opportunities, you know, in my role as the Associate Dean Research and Innovation, one of the, the priorities that I have is connecting research opportunities that are coming from outside of, of the school and connecting not just our researchers, but research teams across the university, including students, PhDs, postdocs, uh, MEDES students, DDES students, uh, and even master's students all the way down to undergraduate level to build out really robust teams to address uh, really challenging uh, problems. Uh, and it's to say that we leverage our collaborative networks to build these interdisciplinary teams. We also uh, focus on increasing our research capacity. So this is not just through our degree programs, but it's also about resources and relationships. Uh, so uh, as Barry mentioned, the CBD lab is a really key a kind of capacity building piece of infrastructure that we have that we're continuing, continuing to, to grow out. And I'll take a few minutes to describe that shortly. The last thing is that we're quite innovation focused. So uh, not just from industry, but also through community partnerships. Uh, when communities have challenges uh, and the world is not delivering on solutions, uh, they look to us and it's it's not that we provide the answers for them but rather we work with them to to iterate and experiment and pilot uh, these new kinds of ideas and activities uh, this is facilitated often through expertise in in focus things like uh, co-creation uh, community engagement digital design fabrication integrative design and a fundamental commitment to an expertise in uh, inter- and multi multidisciplinary projects. The other thing that's very, very important to understand about our projects is, is our stakeholders and making sure that we are serving stakeholders. Um, the primary one that I always look to first is how does a project serve our faculty and our students? If, it, if there's a project that doesn't benefit our, our interests, uh, if it doesn't serve our students, if it doesn't serve the really amazing work that our faculty members are doing, then there's really nothing for us to do. Um, but if it does that, then we can start asking other questions. Uh, for example, does it strengthen our network? Does it provide interdisciplinary research opportunities? Does it connect with other researchers across the university? Does it connect with other project partners? Which is to say, um, is do our projects just serve one individual or can it serve a broader network? And can it, can it actually look at robust and complex ways in which uh, problems and solutions and design are sort of connected uh, with the world? And then that really layers into the last one, which is designing change and maximizing impact. Um, how do we serve society as a stakeholder? Um, and, and how does a project contribute to an innovative and impactful uh, transformation of the design and build environment? So these, these are really key ways in which we frame the work that we do. 
we have a series of, of themes and streams. Uh, these are constantly evolving. Uh, and yet I think that they're a really useful way to understand what we do. And then a lot of this takes place, of course, through the faculty, um, uh, the, the actual building that's on campus, but the CBD lab is a really amazing thing that we, that we put into operation uh, in 2019. Uh, we had just wrapped up basically one full year of activity when COVID hit and really uh, hitting an amazing set of metrics, which we'll talk about in a second. But, but even just inhabiting the main and basement floors of the former Central Public Library, uh, that gives us about 25,000 square feet of space that is dedicated to classrooms, design studios, digital fabrication spaces, conference rooms, public event space, and a city building gallery. Um, we are actively looking, and it's actually part of our mandate, part of our business agreement, uh, with, with the building owners that we uh, are looking forward and finding uh, futures for that physical asset, which is to say that we are looking to expand our presence in this place and that our research is actually oriented around making that, much of our research is oriented around making that happen, which is to say that not just the stuff that's happening inside of that building, but also the impact that it has on the surrounding context. For example, playing into East Village's future development and, and vision as a kind of uh, tech and innovation center. Uh, as Barry described, uh, the CBD lab is a kind of 21st century research and innovation hub that really connects with community industry and academic partners. It serves a variety of individuals um, and it really looks toward new directions in the design, construction, and management of cities. Um, speaking to that first year of activities, you know, we, we uh, uh, were able to really exceed nearly every uh, expectation of us uh, involving um, number of research assistants hired, numbers of grand challenges, um, numbers of companies engaged, numbers of students served, uh, uh, numbers of professionals uh, doing ongoing uh, professional learning opportunities, and public events. The public events especially is something that we, we knew was, was possible, but we didn't necessarily uh, understand how, how robust that is. And, and we have Jess here uh, uh, on, the, on the call today who, who is really at, at the sort of ground zero nexus of helping to make that happen and really understanding all that, that happens down at that space. And uh, you know, now that we're at least partially maybe coming out of uh, COVID, although uh, you know, we're still experiencing challenges, um, uh, we really look forward to, to um, seeing the CBD lab. CBD lab is a really central um, asset uh, to our activities, um, both in terms of research and public engagement. Um, very quickly, um, a couple of current projects and then curricular intersections before touching on some of the advanced degree streams. Um, this is a really, really small set of some of the projects. And then I thought I would highlight two. One is um, Alberto de Salvatierra's uh, uh, Civic Commons Catalyst project. Uh, he arrived here uh, in the summer of last year. Um, and, we're, and we had secured about $100,000 from the Alberta Real Estate Foundation. Um, after an incredibly successful first year, Alberto was able to secure one more year of funding, but for nearly $400,000, uh, uh, which is a remarkable amount of money for such a short period of time. But it is, it's, also, it's mostly remarkable, not for its level of funding, but for the level of partnership and engagement that it's able to sort of uh, create. And this project uh, identifies underutilized spatial assets, then creates design, viable design ideas in these areas and helps build stakeholders uh, and teams, not just of researchers, but actual developers, community partners, municipal partners, to help turn those projects into reality. Um, one of those, uh, for example, is, uh, or that's, that's similar to this is the Green Alley project, which I'm not really talking about in much detail today, but, um, or even the Castell building, uh, where the CBD lab is, is actually a, a really strong example of this is actually in action. Um, but it's, it's a matter of doing research that actually makes change happen. 
Another one where this is, this is quite explicit is the Future of Stephen Avenue project. Uh, this is something that SAPL is quarterbacking through the Office of the Associate Dean Research and Innovation, uh, where we have a, a relatively large uh, budget uh, handed over to us by the city. And the expectation is that we are to build interdisciplinary research teams uh, in order to address one or more of these strategic moves uh, identified along the avenue under the activate and experiment phase of the future of Stephen Avenues, Avenue. So between now, and this really started the beginning of this year, um, but got, got going in earnest over the summer and is now in full, full gear. Um, and we'll be wrapping up uh, the end of next year is a series of um, installations that actually look at um, experimenting with branding, uh, connecting and mobility, activating around the clock, uh, opening up an extending program uh, onto Stephen Avenue itself, repositioning and reprogramming uh, a lot of the vacant spaces in a more active and sustainable way that, that goes beyond some of the standard programming that we see along Stephen Avenue, and also looking at governance, you know, uh, trying to find ways in which to free up or clarify uh, uh, a lot of, um, let's say, governing inefficiencies that take place in that territory that are almost paralyzing to innovation and forward thinking uh, solutions, but uh, in ways that actually serve the public. So really, really exciting projects here. One of them is a community-based art studio that repurposes an old LRT car and puts it in uh, the West, uh, in downtown West. Uh, and it involves community partners like Contemporary Calgary, um, local businesses, uh, the Community Association, Calgary Downtown Association, the city itself, uh, as well as um, uh, uh, really a, a, an ongoing uh, and, and growing list of community partners that will be uh, programming inhabiting that space. And we'll be looking at the kind of impacts that that has. Um, again, as the, the city is actively looking at redesigning and redeveloping that scape. Uh, lastly, curricular intersections. This is the, one of the most important things that we do in the school is that we have research informed courses and we have course informed research. So it's not as though there are just sort of classes about stuff that's separate from what our faculty members are doing, but, but really, um, our faculty members are researching amazing things, folding that back into courses. Students who are taking courses are benefiting from that research um, in many ways and often is the case getting trained in uh, doing uh, the research uh, and then being able to be hired onto these projects. Uh, and again, building sort of new and forging new paths um, into government, into industry, or even into academics. Uh, these are just some of those courses, um, but I don't really want to spend too much time into that. The last thing I'll say is that we, we do have these three advanced degree streams. There's the, the MEDES, which is, is really the one that um, we see strategically with a lot of these projects. If you're, if you're functioning as an MEDES student, oftentimes you are hired on as a kind of project lead uh, in many of these things and orchestrate um, a, a lot of the work um, and then are able to build a thesis that relates to that experience. Um, we have amazing kind of industry placement coming out of our MEDES degree. Also, of course, in a more classical way, uh, PhDs uh, and even postdocs uh, connect to these. Uh, we are actively trying to grow our postdoc uh, population uh, in the school. But again, that comes out of a, a, a kind of funded research success over time. Um, and right now we are really focusing quite squarely on industry partnerships and layering that in and leveraging that into tr more tri-council classic research funding. Then lastly, a doctorate of design, which um, in where uh, mid-career professionals are able to uh, basically innovate uh, with an idea um, and even plug into some of the university's uh, entrepreneurial uh, uh, and startup streams. Um, and connect with uh, other, other degree programs and research programs uh, uh, that might intersect with those ideas. The ME DES degree, uh, you know, more specifically and very briefly, um, uh, we, we try to fund our ME DES degree students as much as possible, but there's a range. You can come do an ME DES degree and get almost zero level of funding and support, uh, and that's, that's fine, but also there's a lot of opportunities for scholarships, research assistantships and teaching assistantships. 
uh, and this comes out of a variety of funding streams. Um, uh, one of them uh, that we that we found a great deal of success with, and it really is quite responsive and flexible, is MyTax, uh, where um, we're able to, in collaboration with industry partners, develop uh, uh, problem-based research uh, agendas uh, that that start to plug into the 16-month period that is uh, sort of the typical ME does uh, duration and where students can actually uh, earn through a MyTax uh, project between 20 and 30K uh, over that period, uh, which clearly you know, helps offset costs of being a student. Uh, but also, you know, we, we actually take a philosophy uh, within the school where you know, if you're in a first professional degree or you know, let's say even an undergrad, yeah, of course, you know, come, you know, you're, you're bringing, paying money and, and getting knowledge uh, through, through the faculty. But once you start to get to some of these more advanced degree streams, in many cases, uh, you're, you're making a contribution to the project and there is a sort of a financial reciprocity there uh, where um, you know, it is industry um, investing in that future and that uh, students play a really critical role in, in finding and forging that future. Um, Barry talked about the timing, so I'm not gonna really get too much into that. Um, but I think I'll sort of kind of um, speak very quickly to some of the industry partners that we have, and this is a, always an ever expanding list. I mean, this is, this is actually probably six months out of date. So it's, there's probably, you know, four, five, six more uh, partners that could be added to this list. Um, but it's worth saying that when students come through the ME does degree specifically, when they come out, they are not going into your basic entry level position in companies. Often is the case, you're basically going into an R&D department or even leading out in some of these divisions with companies that it's basically an extension of those research projects, or uh, you're going into a role where you are the, the industry representative on some of our future research collaborations with them. So quite, quite an interesting kind of hybrid and kind of transformation that we're seeing in industry that we're quite actively trying to pursue. And we see it as a positive evolution of, of our operations here. So that's, that's I'll just sort of wrap up my, my spiel there. Um, and with this as a question, you know, that we, we really like to pose as a challenge, uh, bo both to our faculty members and to our students and to our partners, which is asking how can you make the biggest difference. So thanks very much. Thank you, Josh. Um, I really enjoyed that. That was excellent. Um, at this oh, point- Oh, look, Shay is here. All right. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> We've invited Shay to join us um, to help answer some of the questions that may come up. And so, you know, it is with uh, great pleasure that we welcome um, one of our recent alum, um who is actually i think his thesis was was really really interesting and just the variety of different takes and technologies that were incorporated within it and so welcome and thank you for joining us thanks very uh, uh sorry, sorry, sorry i wasn't able to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you've been up to recently uh right yeah um <laughs> <laughs> i'm uh my name is shay really um so yeah i was I think yeah, the, the first MEDS set with the in collaboration with the MyTax, um, MyTax and, and industry partners were kind of like the guinea pigs <laughs> of the program, successful guinea pigs, um, if I may. Uh, but yeah, that uh, I think I did that. I started that 2018 and finished that 2019, so it spanned over 16 months. Um, unfortunately, I didn't catch the first part of the presentation, so I don't know um, if. Uh, I, I'm sure Barry probably talked about it, the timeline. I don't know if it's the same thing or not, but but then it was 16 months. Um, and I got to work with McKinley Burkett, which is now McKinley Studios, uh, one of the firms that Josh mentioned. And yeah, I think it was it was one of the most interesting opportunities I'd say I had, because uh, I, I remember having a conversation with Josh <laughs> before starting it and seeing if I, if I could push it or something, but I'm glad I didn't. Um, I'm glad I did it. It was a it was a great opportunity. Um, yeah, like like Josh and Barry mentioned, like we had a lot of um, opportunities to sort of collaborate with the firms that we were placed with, sort of working working on real time projects with them and folding that back into our research. So 
for me, my research kind of, I mean, I had an idea going in uh, into the program, but working with McKinley Burkett and working with the laboratory, uh, the C, well, CBD lab now, I would say it was the lead lab at the time. Um, it was like the transitional phase. Um, but yeah, working, working half time at McKinley Burke at an half time um, at, at the lead, um, my research sort of started to develop and, and sort of changed direction into, into something more uh, informed and, and more focused. Um, and so I, I looked into <clears throat> uh, the idea of deconstructing buildings, um, but being able to sort of track all that you need at the beginning stage of construction and design. Uh, with what I titled a procedural passport uh, throughout the life life phase of the building and, and having the tools and information uh, that you would need with the software uh, that you would need to sort of take the building apart and recycle parts. Um, and of course, I did that with mod, uh, with with a with a modular solution, uh, which again folds back to like the work that I had done at McKinley Burkett because when I started there, uh, they were working at they were working on a modular housing solution, which I was heavily involved with. Um, I created a tool for them uh, that they could use to sort of uh, interact with clients and, and produce iterations, multiple iterations and, and varied iterations of, of, uh, of a modular house to suit different clients' needs uh, based on rules that were set up in the software. Um, so, so that was kind of how my research developed. And it, yeah, it was, it was really an exciting journey. Um, and I think like, like now I'm teaching at the university, uh, I'm teaching studio at the university and I'm working at Sturgis Architecture at the same time. Um, and all of the opportunities that I had post and during school uh, sort of spun off of this, like, like just said, there's opportunities to get involved in research and you know, like collaboration between companies and the faculty and, and sort of extending that relationship after school. Um, I, think, I think all of those are indeed positive uh, results of like deciding to do something like this. Yeah. I think that was a really long in introduction, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Say. Um, our, I think I, we should open that up and see if there's any questions from the floor. We've got about uh, eight minutes left here. Um, are there any questions from, from any of our guests? Um, hi, I have a couple of questions, but uh, sorry, my video is going to be off just because I'm not in a place where I can turn on my video. Um, thank you for all the presentations. They were all great. Um, my first question is, is it safe to say that the MEDES is like the only way to then get into the PhD programs if you've done the EMAC because the EMAC is cost based or can one go from the EMAC into a, like PhD program? That was my first question. Um. Typically, um, we look for people who have a research degree as background to getting into the, to the PhD. But depending on the quality of the application and the candidate, we tend to review all applications on a case-by-case -case basis. So it's not absolutely mandated. Josh, I saw you shaking your head on that one, nodding up and down, I should say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, way, the way I would answer it is, uh, no, the MEDES is absolutely not a prerequisite for the PhD. Um, I think what the, the way that the ME does functions is, especially for people who don't necessarily know if they wanna go further into industry or further into academics or even into, into you know, government uh, and policy oriented things, the ME does provides a really rich experience mm -hmm. to um, enhance uh, really relevant skill sets and, and really look at really relevant problems. Uh, and at the same time, probably get a much stronger idea about what kind of direction one might want to go into. Uh, we just had a, an ME does defense um, on, uh, on Monday uh, uh, from a student named Matt Walker that I've been supervising. And it, uh, amazing, amazing work connected through MyTax, uh, industry partnerships looking at really innovative robotically fabricated building envelopes uh, driven by uh, performance-based software um, and a lot of material specificity around mass timber. Um, his, his uh, and Shay can kind of speak to this. I mean, a typical, a typical master's uh, thesis document 
let's say it might be, you know, let's say uh, 100 pages or so, totally substantial uh, work for, for a master's student. I think Matt's, Matt's uh, thesis this year was something like three to 400 pages, somewhere in that, in that envelope. Uh, really amazing work. So it, you know, there there is the opportunity, and I and, and I don't necessarily know what direction he's going to go. If he's going to go into industry or academics, he clearly has the capacity to do either. Um, and and the the ME Des degree really does provide the kind of flexibility to make it as PhD ish as as uh, one would want to do without having the obligations of being a full PhD and having to go through a you know, a three, four or seven year process, you know, that goes kind of sideways. Um, so it, it is it is a bit tidier, uh, but, but also to Barry's point, let's say that you're someone uh, who's come through like the MARC or the M plan program, which does not necessarily build up your chops as a researcher. Um, the ME DES does provide some base level skill sets um, that can really make someone a much more potent and uh, capable PhD um, uh, when it comes down to that time, especially in disciplines that, that don't necessarily have PhD, you know, conventional PhDs as their, as their model for, for practice or even academics. It's probably worth just adding on to that, the, the kind of the difference between an ME DES and a PhD. Um, the, the ME DES, of course, is that sort of 16 to 24 month window. Um, a PhD is typically four years. And it isn't just a matter of sitting down and beginning your research, but there's actually some initial steps which are called candidacy and there's aspects of, of completing both coursework, preparing a proposal, and then undertaking examinations that then allows you to initiate your research. So it's, it's a much more involved process and, and certainly the ME does is a nice stepping stone to that to, to help people prepare with it, to, to undertake it. But as Josh said, there's lots of pathways um, and the idea is, is really understanding the integrity of the student's pathway and what actually can, can respond to that within our capacity as a school. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, my next question, sorry. Um, so I know you mentioned the 16-month pathway, like when you do the MAC program, but then if you do the MAC program and then you take like a gap year or like two years, for example, when you come back, does that still apply or do you have to do the entire 24 months? Um, it has a lot to do with what the nature of the research project is. So we can admit people to the spring of, if they take a gap year, they can be admitted to the spring uh, cohort and get a jump on that. And typically we like that one to be in place with a research project. And so if that is, is existing at the time, then we can expedite the, the process at that point. And to clarify, the MARC degree is its own separate thing mm -hmm. like i think i think you know maybe it was just a sort of a a, a misnomer but but you know what we were talking about is the me does degree mm -hmm. um and what and what that looks like and the the mark program has its own set of you know whether you're doing it as a as the the my the minor or or coming in a foundation year or transferring into the m1 and juggling all that kind of stuff that's that's a that's a much different you know, ball of wax there. But of course, um, any student can take any amount of time that they prefer between degrees to do whatever. Um, that's, you know, uh, even speaking for myself, I worked for uh, about two, you know, two or three years between my undergraduate and my graduate degree um, strategically to get, you know, uh, industry experience, uh, you know, before returning to school. So, um, but, but many, many of my cohorts or classmates uh, from undergrad just went straight into graduate school and did it that way. And, you know, there, everyone has a variety of different paths to, to take. But, mm -hmm. but in general, um, what I would say is it, it, it's generally problematic to try to interrupt things mid-degree. You know, if, you're, if you commit to starting a degree, it works much better to just get through it and not interrupt it at any point in time that actually creates a lot of pedagogical challenges mm -hmm. yeah especially within the sort of course-based structure of the, the master of architecture with its cohort 
I'm definitely a lot of connections and a, a lot of shared sort of knowledge within the class. Um, did you have additional questions? I think I'll stop there just because of time. Thank you. All right, we're at time. Um, I'm happy to entertain perhaps one last question if there is one. Um, I have a question. So there seems to be lots around like fabrication and digital design and those kind of things. I just wanted to ask if there are like other areas or avenues or like that we can research into if we want to be MEDES or is that dependent on like the supervisor that is available or that we find? Thank you. Well, that's a, that, sorry, actually, maybe I'll take that. So that's a, a really good question. Um, the the ME DES degree, similar to a PhD, it really is dependent on supervision. You know, uh, it takes a supervisor to be able to do it. Uh, but absolutely, the the the. I mean, I didn't elaborate too much on the themes and streams, but but there were four that were sort of posted in this presentation. Um, uh, of course, there are things that that move outside of digital fabrication for sure. Um, uh, you know, just plan, planning and policy. Um, you know, uh, a, a, a landscape, you know, that all, all, mm -hmm. you know, very, very robust range um, out there. Uh, but, but the best way to find out kind of what's going on is to actually look into the work that our faculty members are doing. Uh, that, that's the, the clearest way to get any snapshot of what, you know, even the stuff that we're presenting as past projects, um, may not necessarily current be, currently be in action, or maybe they, they took a different tack moving on you know, into the future, or it evolved into something else. So um, there, there's a, a really robust and, and dynamic and interesting set of research activities and agendas in the faculty. And there's, it's the students, it's the partners, it's the faculty members, all of those things contribute to the direction that, that any of these projects ultimately take. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite a wide, quite a wide range, and we also have, you know, within those twenty-seven members of faculty, a range of expertise and research experience that that students and and supervisors can tap into to kind of synergistically develop a thesis topic in a whole variety of different ways. Um, thank you very much, Josh, and I think we will wrap it up there. Um, thank you, Jess, for, for organizing the Zoom and the event. Thank you, Jen and Alexa, for your help in helping to, to prepare and to support it. Shay, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see you again. I hope all is well. Yeah. And, and thank you to all of our uh, potential applicants. Um, if you do have other questions, you, one can follow up with Jen or Alexa um, or myself. And just uh, thank you again, and I, I enjoy the rest of your week. Bye, everybody.